check the fluoro and we're not able to see the anatomy we need to see in a lateral view. Um, so we're gonna have to start up a little higher to count down and make sure we're in the right level fixing. We're fixing C67. Um, he has a very short neck, very thick neck, very big shoulder. So the lateral view on x-ray is very poor. Um, we're gonna need a bigger exposure to make sure that we are at the right level. So uh, we're gonna do an oblique incision, which will give us better, better access. I'm feeling for his cartilage here. We want to be just medial to the sternocleidomastoid incision. How's the blood pressure? Take. Okay, perfect. All right, let me have the the bovi. So we've cut through the skin and the subcutaneous tissues using a bovi coagulator. There's two modes, there's cut and coag. You can use the cut mode on skin. You cannot use the coag mode on skin. All right, you'll end up burning the skin. So pickups, okay, very good. So let me have the bovi. We're gonna go through the Tisma muscle. Uh, let me see the bipolar. Have a little bit of bleeding here from a little vein, a little arterial just under the skin. Want to make sure we get that under control early on. Bovi. Our patient um, had an injury to his neck, as a result of which he has a herniated disc. And we talked about doing um, laser surgery originally, but given the, the thickness of his neck, I didn't think it was very safe to do. There are, um, you know, the, probably the biggest reason not to be able to do the laser surgery is a very thick neck. And the problem is I'm not able to feel and palpate the spine. And if I can't feel the spine, then I can't do the laser surgery safely. So we discussed that, because he originally wanted to do laser disc repair, and I told him I just couldn't do it safely, the, that the risk would be high that we'd have to abort. Now, even with an ACDF, which is an open surgery, it's a much easier surgery for me to, to get the anatomy right. Um, that's, that's gonna be hard in him because his neck is so thick. He has really the neck of a football player. So it makes the, the surgery harder for any surgeon that wants to access the spine because you have more soft tissue to go through. And typically with thicker necks, you have um, more tissue, so you have more blood vessels. More blood vessels mean more bleeding. So, We've been doing spinal fusions now here at the surgery center, Vieira in Melbourne, Florida for six, six years. And an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion is, of all the fusion surgeries of the spine we do on the back, lower back, neck, thoracic, this is one of the uh, more straightforward types of surgery. Now once again, normally for a single level, I wouldn't do an oblique incision, but because of the thickness of his neck and the poor visibility with the x-ray machine, I have to do a, uh, an oblique incision. Otherwise, um, it will create problems later on in the surgery when we get down to the spine and I'm not able to see the proper disc levels. So in anticipation of that issue, I've opted for a, an oblique incision. Let's see, uh, Bovi. Yes, sir. Lift up. I've got Dr. Patel here helping me. Dr. Patel has been helping me with surgeries now for how long, Dr. Patel? Uh, for for almost a year, right? April. So you, you're, he knows our anniversary date, April. 
And Dr. Patel is actually an interventionalist, so he's kind of a surgeon himself, um, but he does uh, more minimally invasive procedures. He doesn't do open procedures like this very often. He does some, um, like spinal cord stimulator implants. But for the most part, he's a, a minimally invasive type surgeon. But he's been a phenomenal assistant surgeon to me through these cases. All right, so you all can see we're making our way down. Uh, and I think this is the omohyoid muscle. So this is the sternocleidomastoid here. This is the omohyoid. And so far, things are going well. The platysma muscle is up here. We just need to keep going until we hit the spine. I need a liftless. So at this point, when I see the omohyoid, I like to go above it at the top margin. And I use a, um, a lipless retractor along with the kitty, which Luis knows. And there's that spot that I like to go right there, just north of the omohyoid, try to preserve the omohyoid. Preserve means not cut or injure. And again, we are just medial to the carotid sheath. Uh, bipolar. Come on, Luis, get it in my hand. So the bipolar is used to coagulate or cook tissues, mostly little blood vessels, kitty, so that um, there won't be the bleeding, you know? You can't just do surgery and, and not stop the bleeding. If you, if you don't stop bleeding during surgery, the patient will bleed to death. So it's very important during surgery that you have good control over the bleeding. Now he has a very deep neck. Okay, let me just feel. I feel the spine. I'm right on top of the discs, I can feel it. I just don't know which disc, because we haven't checked yet. Kitty. Um, but yeah, definitely making some progress here. Once again, the surgery is very difficult to do on a patient who has a very thick neck, bipolar. And it just makes it a lot harder to do the surgery safely when a patient has a really, really thick neck. So it's a consideration, but scissor, for any surgeon that does anterior cervical surgery, you really want to optimize the situation. Kitty, come on. Oh my God. This may be the deepest neck I've ever done. I'm really glad we changed the incision. I wouldn't have been able to do this with a transverse incision. Let me have a lift. So I'm down on the spine and it's literally the deepest I've ever seen. Your hand is in the way. So yeah, this would have been impossible to do. You don't get to, you're, you're basically, look, you need to be, see this shaft? It needs to be straight down. You're like this, which is, relaxing your hand, it makes it easy for you, but it's not showing me what I need to see. You need a toe in. There's the carotid artery, and I can see the discs. You understand the difference? You're like this, easy, relaxed. You need to be like this, okay? All right, kitty. There's a little bit of fat down here in the retro, hold it there, in the retropharyngeal space. I can see the discs. There's the first disc. You all see that, Sean? Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay, good. The only problem is we don't know which disc it is. So that's why we need the x-ray machine. Bipolar? So we're gonna use the x-ray machine in a minute to figure out what disc that is. We wanna make sure we operate on the proper disc. That's C67. I suspect, let go. I suspect that's either five, six or four, five. So we'll find out in just a minute. Hold this here. Localizer. Let's get a fluoro shot. Okay, Dr. Patel, look, 
When you retract, let me show you. When you retract, you've got to retract with the tip, not your hand like this. That's not helping. You have to pull the whole thing over. There you go. All right, perfect. Let me have a localizer quickly. This is going to be super long blades. We have 55, 60. All right, come out. Don't knock me. All right, so we're, we're looking at one disc. We, we've got it pinned. Hold this, please. And then we're going to see which disc it is. Don't let it come up, okay? All right, let's get the floor in and the table up, please. So I've got to know where I am in the neck. I need the shoulders pulled. Luis, you got your lead on? Hey, come on. Pay attention. Watch all the sterile field over here. I don't want you anywhere near that. Table up probably a little more. I don't think your table's up high enough. Jordan. Gary, come on, man. Anticipate a little bit. Any questions from our audience so far? We do have one, yes. All right, I'll take it in just a second. Okay. So for those of you watching, the first part of any surgery where the surgeon goes from the outside world down, okay, pull that shoulder, that's good. So two, three, four, five. That looks like four, five. Everyone agree? agree. Let's just get one more to confirm. We're using a lateral fluoro. Dr. Patel, you agree? Yeah. All right, table down, fluoro out, nice job. Stay where you are, Dr. Patel. So that's pretty much, I thought it was either 5.6 or 4.5. It's a little high for 5.6, so I'm happy. We're going to be okay. But this is seriously the deepest wound. So he takes the cake. Hmm? Height is, is. Can you see, Dr. Patel? I think we're okay. You may need another step up. All right, give me a second, Sean. I want to focus right here for a minute. I need the, the lip, please. So the first part of the surgery is called the exposure, and that's what we're doing. We're exposing the spine, okay? Hold this here, okay? I need that, and I need a kitty, okay? Do you see that disc right there? We know that's four or five, okay? No, 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 just give me a second here, okay? I'm gonna have to wait on answering in a, for a minute. Let me have the scissors, and we're gonna need the scissors and bipolar. This is just some fascial attachments here. There usually is a little vessel in here, like a vein. So I'm just being careful. This is the superior margin of the omohyoid, by the way. So if we have to sacrifice the omohyoid, we can. We can safely take it. It won't affect the patient very much, but I don't like taking any normal structures unless it's absolutely necessary. Let me see. We know that's four or five there. We want to get way down here. I'll be honest with you, a lot of surgeons wouldn't even do surgery on a patient that's this thick. Hold this here. Because um, it's just so difficult to do. trying to sweep the soft tissue. There's four, five, we know, right? And then five, six will be here. And what we need to do is I need a little bit more, just a little bit, Dr. Patel. See that? That's perfect, right? Five, six, and then six, seven. And our target is six, seven, right? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Everybody's in agreement? I, agree, sir. I think that's right here, to be honest with you. But we're gonna make absolutely sure. So bipolar of it. Now, the blades here, what, what size do we have? 55, 60. Let me have the bipolar. Yes, sir. Toe in a little bit, move north. Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm going to take the question in just a minute from the audience, but I want to make sure we get this right. It's a very important part of the surgery. It's a very difficult part of the surgery is Kidner. North. 
So I want to connect the dots, Dr. Patel. That's 4, 5, right? And then this has got to be 5, 6. And this has got to be 6, 7 down here. Mm -hmm. But I want to make absolutely sure, as sure as humanly possible, More? bipolar, bipolar. So 6, 7 is the hardest disc to get to if you're not counting C7, T1. And C7, T1, scissor, almost never is a problem. C7, T1 is almost never a problem. Because um, it, it's rarely herniates. All right, so again, very, very difficult situation. Let me see, four, five. No, no, it's not, that's not the issue. It's, Dr. Patel's gonna grade that. No, that's four, five up there. See the hole in the disc right in the front? Yes. And I have it. See this right here? That's four five. See it? That's the one we marked, four five. This has got to be the five. Then five six. And then six seven. It'd be really nice if I can get a localizer, take that bipolar, or give it to Patel bipolar. If I can just get something in five six, to be absolutely sure. But there's a lot of inflammation in front of 5-6, you know? And that inflammation, I think, um, probably in, it indicates a, an issue with the anterior disc. Okay. Scissor. Never mind, it went right here, show me. That's going to be six, seven right there. We want to verify that, but I want to loosen all this up nice so we don't have to retract so hard because retraction is going to be something we want to try to have as little force on the retraction as possible. Definitely the right choice to do an oblique incision. Scissor, that's really allowed us to free things up so we don't have to retract so hard. And the muscle relaxation is definitely helping. Okay, Kitty. I'm using a technique of blunt dissection. That's the carotid artery right there. All right. Dr. Patel, you didn't know you were signing up for a difficult case, did you, this morning when you woke up? Yeah, you say easy. Uh, <laughs> don't say that. This is honestly a very difficult case. Well, easy would be a nice skinny little lady, right? Skinny necks are always easier to deal with. So that's your omohyoid muscle right there. Again, we're not cutting it. Um, how's blood pressure, good? Yeah. Everything good, bipolar? So we're just down here, you know, um, right over the disc space, and I need to verify that we're in the right disc before I start any kind of discectomy. Scissor. So I want to use the x-ray another time. Bipolar. Ready? Go, go south just a little bit, Dr. Patel. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so let's try to tag 5-6 and see if we can see it. Dr. Patel, that requires you to move north. Keep going. All right, so we know that's 4-5. I believe that's 5-6 right there. With a little bit of... No, that's four five. That's five. Bipolar. Okay. Put it in my hand in a way I can use it. Put, no, put it in my hand in a way I can use it. Put it in my hand in a way I can use it. No. It's like this. 
Okay, so try again. Suck, please. All right. You doing all right over there? Okay. Move north again. Suck. Huh? I can't hear you. What's the struggle? Keeping his uh, blood pressure? I need a localizer. Yeah, I've got to figure out because I can't see. There we go. That's probably 5.6. So let's take a look. Come on out. We need to hold this here. He's got like an osteophyte in front of 5.6. Table up, please. I'll need a shoulder pull. Stay away from the sterile table. Take your time. Let's get the table up. All right, let's see if I can answer a question while we're putting the patient in position to get an x-ray. I don't think it's high enough. Sean, you want to ask me the question from the audience? Yes, one of our viewers is just wondering. Enough, okay, you got to get it up, Jordan. You, you, you got to know where the table needs to be so we don't keep taking pictures. All right, so two, three, four. It's hard to say, but we need you to come south a little bit with the fluoro, just a little bit. And I need a better shoulder pull. Luis, you got to squeeze the shoulders down towards the feet. Take a shot. All right, good, good, good. So everyone relax, let me get in here and look. Okay, let me get in here and look. Two, no, two, three, four, five, six. Do you agree, Dr. Patel? All right, good. You can lower the bed. We are now, we've moved from four, five down to five, six. So we, again, our target is six, seven. So it's the disc below this. But now that we know five, six, we just move down one disc, I can see that, and it's six, seven. But it's impossible to see on the x-ray because of the thickness of his shoulders. And if you're wondering, we have literally the top of the line in the world fluoroscope here. So there is no better. And if we didn't have this fluoroscope, I honestly don't think we could do this surgery. Hold this here. I gotta get my hand around here. Don't come out, whatever you do. You can see all the anatomy. Take this. Oh, actually, I need this. Take this, Dr. Patel. Okay, let go. Okay, just get comfortable with your retractor. All right. So, sorry, Sean. I'll be back with you in a minute. We know that's 5, 6 right there. So let's go south. There's 6, 7. That's got to be 6, 7 right there, okay? So out, and now I'm gonna mark six, seven. This would be the vertebral body of six. This is the six, seven disc space. We're only doing one disc today, six, seven. Everybody agree? agree. Come south. And the exposure needs to basically be uh, the disc itself, which is right here and half of the vertebral body below, half of the vertebral body above. That's how it works. I, I need you to protect the esophagus. There you go. Not too much, Dr. Patel. You can ease up a little to me. So Dr. Patel is retracting the esophagus. Can you all see this here? This thing here is the esophagus, okay? The swallowing tube. And surgeons screw up with that all the time, okay? I had a patient come to me that had an ACDF done at a surgery center down south, and uh, the surgeon cut through his esophagus while he was opening the, the spine, getting down to the spine, doing the exposure. And the worst thing about it was the surgeon acknowledged that he cut through the esophagus, and then he told the patient to go home, which you never do. That's an emergency. You have to admit the patient to the hospital. But they didn't want to admit the patient to the hospital because that would look bad for their surgery center. 
So instead, they closed the guy up, <clears throat> sent him home, knowing the next day he would be in the emergency room at the hospital where he lived. He, he came from out of town. This was personal injury. What do you think? Bipolar. That's a bipolar hand. Okay. It's hurt. That was a personal injury case. So personal injury lawyers were involved. A bunch of scumbags, as far as I'm concerned. They they don't care about the quality of surgery that the patients get. They just want the cheapest surgeon and the cheapest surgery center where they can make the most money off of that surgery from the insurance company. And that poor patient uh, was admitted to the hospital here, and he spent two weeks in the hospital with uh, food coming out of his esophagus into his neck. All right, what are we, where are we bleeding there? Suck all that, bipolar. Yep, I see it. So he ended up getting a swallowing study where they put barium, and he had six perforations of the esophagus, six leakages, where his, the barium he swallowed went out into his neck in six places. So the treatment, of course, is either to explore it surgically and repair the esophagus, or to make the, pa you have to make the patient MPO, which means they don't eat. So you, you feed them with tube feeding for two weeks while the esophagus heals. All right, hold this here. How's our muscle relaxation? We, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're almost kind of done needing it, like, but we just need it for a little bit more, like another 20, 30 minutes max. So again, very deep disc, but we're getting it done because this is Duke Spine Institute, best in the world. And I'll be honest, it's not easy. This, this patient has made it challenging for us. Hold this here, okay? Hold this here. This is where you hold here and get me the pen tool. Yes, sir. Hold it there. Dr. Fazil, you ready? Okay, so what, what's coming out under Luis's retractor right there is called the, what? No, it's not the carotid, it's a muscle. All right, what muscle is that? Hold this. Yeah, longest colon muscle. That's the right side, hold this here. Okay, you keep moving, Luis, hold it here. Hold, feel the bottom and hold it there. Okay, let me see. right here good dr. Patel I need to see down south yep perfect keep it there keep it there don't move nobody move Louise don't move dr. Patel I need you to suck those fumes or I can't see okay so dr. Patel is protecting the esophagus and Louise is protecting the carotid artery Louise being on my side suck here suck here please right here I need to get this tissue off of the spine. There we go. That tissue specifically is the longus coli muscle on Dr. Patel's side. All right. Perfect. Take this. Yes, sir. Take that. Yes, sir. Okay, good. <clears throat> so here we are. We've exposed half of C6 and half of C7 down below. Let me see down below. This is a deep, deep hole, uh, uh, Luis. So I'm thinking. What size retractors do I we have? have? 55, 60 right now, sir. That's the biggest? Uh, I think we have more. Uh, I think 55, 60 might work. Sorry. Let's try that. Let me sorry. see this, please. I want to see how much retraction you're doing. All right, good. You all see that? That's the disc right there. That's the front of the disc. And actually, there's a little bit of bone spurring. Hold that there. Push down and hold it. Don't let it slip. I large bite. Yes, so to get rid of some of the bone spurs, we usually take a large bite and bite them off. Otherwise, the metal plate we're going to put in won't sit on the spine properly. So this ACDF you're watching, anterior cervical discectomy infusion, is I've done over 1,000 in my career. I don't do a lot of these anymore because everything I do is with a laser. But some people need this done because the laser won't work for them. It, it's about two out of 100. Hey, hold this over like uh, that. Okay. Yep, protect. Okay, now suck. All right, Sean, I'm ready for your question. Let's get our retractor in. Yes, sir. 
Yes. One of our viewers is wondering, what would cause leg symptoms to suddenly go from one leg to the other? What would cause leg symptoms to suddenly go from one leg to the other? Take. Yes, sir. All right, great question. There's a lot of things, um, but I'm assuming that the leg symptoms are due to pinched nerves, okay? There are other causes of leg symptoms besides pinched nerves. And one of those is blood vessels being narrowed, like an artery. I can't get down. Yeah, that's, that's, that's better. I still need a little bit more pulling. Just a little bit, yeah. That's great. Oh, yeah, I love it. Perfect. Come off. All right, this 5560, Louis, was a really good call on your part. Thank you. Hold that there. Hold it up. Hey, don't, don't tilt it back. Hold it up. Hold it up. All right. Um, so I don't know why you have leg symptoms. Whoever asked the question, okay, or whoever has leg symptoms. But there are artery that get blocked. So it could be blockage of an artery on, on the other side. It could be a vein that's thrombosing. But if it's nerves, pinched nerves, then it could be that the stenosis or narrowing where the nerves come out at that level is now affecting both sides. A very common problem, okay? Okay, lip, lipless, lipless, and Dr. Patel, I need you sucking here. All right, I, and hold this for me. Hold that, yep. I need a bovi, bovi. Don't move this retractor. So again, this is C67, very, very, very difficult to do. And up north, let me have a pen field. Okay, just stay where you are. Don't move the retractor. So far, it's going really good. And again, it's very hard to do because he's got such a thick neck. But I need to be right on the bone. I don't want to go through soft tissue. Okay, so that's where my post is going to go, right in the middle. So basically, that whatever is pinching your nerve on the one side is now going to be pinching the nerve on the other. If it's a herniated disc, then you've got a herniated disc. If it's instability, like the spine is moving and sliding, now it's sliding enough to pinch the nerve on the other side. So very common. We'd need an MRI really to figure out why, uh, why you have symptoms on the other side. An MRI, possibly. If you can't get an MRI, then a CAT scan. All right. I'm putting a post in C6, okay? And now I'm going to put a post in C7. I need the, I need the oh, yeah, sorry. Post in. Dr. Patel, you doing all right there? Mm -hmm. Can you suck for me? Let's see what we got. Okay. So you want to put the post square in the middle of the vertebral body, right at the margin of that soft tissue. And you want it to kind of be parallel. You don't want to go through the end plate. What is that? Let me see. That looks pretty good. Where's the end plate? Let me see a pen field. Yes, sir. Okay. You got to put things in my hand in a way I can use them. I got to teach you. Okay, fingertips. Okay, surgeons operate with their fingertips. Okay, good. Perfect. So that's a perfect spot for the post. Okay, we're going to do what's called parallel distraction of the disc space. It's a standard proper technique for ACDF. You're opening the disc, disc space up so you can get the disc out. Don't put pressure on the post. OK, my wedding song. Did I answer this person's question, Sean, properly? Are they happy? or? I believe so, yes. You know, th there's a lot of reasons you can have leg pain on one side and then it switches to the other, OK? I mean, you could have a fracture, you could have a tumor, you could have an infection. Those are all serious, fast problems that need to be addressed right away, emergency. It could be a herniated disc that's getting worse. Okay, right now we've got our distraction posts in, the, the disc is under distraction, I'm gonna cut through the annulus. Now look, the annulus is already disrupted. So this, this is an evidence of trauma. Okay, this is a traumatic avulsion of the disc off the bone. And look where it's still attached down here at the bottom at C7, but it's avulsed, ripped right off of the bone at the bottom of C6. So this is trauma, massive trauma. Okay. We will be done in 30 minutes. Doctor, 
30 minutes will be done. I mean, we'll be closing, I should say. Okay. Take what? We got a second anesthesia. Yeah, I'm just telling you so for the anesthesia, for the general. You can wake him up. All right, so this disc is fractured right off the bone. Wipe. Dr. Patel, you should have the pituitary. I should have the curette. Okay. Wipe. So send that disc material. Here you go. Thank you. Let me have a scraper, number five. So I use a Codman curette, best in the world. If you do this kind of surgery in your future, or you do it now, don't substitute. The Codman is unsubstitutable. There's lots of vendors out there trying to get you to buy cheap uh, offshoots or substitutes, but this is a very special instrument. And I've tried the, uh, the cheap versions and they don't work. I tried it many years ago, and they don't work. You need the OG, Codman Cervical Spine Curettes. And it's because of the way they're designed. And uh, the people that, you know, try to do knockoffs, they, they either can't because of patenting or they don't understand the design features that are, make it so good because they never seem to reproduce it. The other thing you get a lot of uh, knockoffs is this, this retractor. For ACDF, it's the best in the world. What is this called? It's called a Caspar retractor. And we buy this system, I think it's from V. Mueller. It's German, the best in the world. No substitutes. Okay, why am I saying this, folks? Because if you are watching these surgeries, which we hope you are, and you wanna improve your technique if you're a surgeon, um, your in equipment is so important to have the best equipment for the job. If, the, if I didn't have the uh, proper retractors or the proper curettes, then the, these things would be moving around during the surgery, making my job a thousand times harder. And once you, they start moving around on you, then you're gonna injure something you shouldn't be injuring because they're retracting important vital structures like the esophagus and carotid. And if they're moving, then you're gonna grab something that just got moved that you shouldn't have grabbed, okay? I'm telling you. I've seen it happen, not with me, but with other surgeons. And they, what is that? That's water. You, you go pee water. on the floor over there? Yeah. Curette, be careful now. You should always be able to see your instrument tip. Never go blindly anywhere. This is a five? That's a five. Good. Yeah, it's a nice disc space, and we got good distraction. Distraction is spreading open of the, of the bones. So we've got really good distraction, and you can clearly see that this disc was injured, traumatic. You can see evidence of inflammation here, right here. A lot of scar tissue inside the disc, around the annulus. And, uh, Inflammation usually indicates injury. So this patient has injury and inflammation. The other causes of inflammation are tumors and infections. Kerosin, but I don't see any tumor or infection. This is all trauma, trauma related for sure. All right. Okay, at this point, uh, I wanna drop the table all the way and I'm gonna bring that scope in. So folks, you're in for a treat if you think this surgeon's view is exciting and interesting and fun, wait till you get to the next view, which is the microscope. The microscope we use is a $200,000 microscope just for doing basically ACDFs and microdiscectomies. And uh, most hospitals don't even have this kind of a microscope available for their surgeons. A lot of surgeons do these surgeries without a microscope and it's dangerous if you do it without a microscope and you're not gonna get the same effect. All right, we've done a really good discectomy. Everything's looking good. Pituitary, I see that disc piece you're after. It's right here. Okay, a little piece of cartilage. Okay, let's get the microscope in, everyone. Let's get the light out, Dr. Patel, and let's get this headlight off me. Turn the OR lights on. Make sure you don't contaminate, Luis. Make sure they don't contaminate scope. He's already touched that. I know, but I want you supervising. Whoa, we got, why are we flooding with nurses? All right, so let me get in here. Just don't touch that. Hi. 
So kind of to summarize where we are so far, we've done the exposure, which means exposing the spine, getting the retractors in. Whoa, whoa, loosen it first. Come on, guys. How's that sound, Sean? Is it too loud? Why don't you pull the mic away from my lips a little bit? There we go. Is that better, Sean? Yeah, I think that's better. Yes, sounds good. All right. Is that good right there? We good? You guys, we good? Yeah. All right, let's get this off the scope. Yeah. Yep, just get those drapes off. All right, now it should be sterile. I'm gr taking the scope. Yep. Now the microscope has two eye ports or two heads. One is for the surgeon, one's for the assistant. Whoa, wait, whoa, whoa. Help him. Don't, well, don't hit the, the IV stand. Come around and in. You guys want the base right in here. All right, so we're bringing this, wait, watch this uh, drape here. Grab that and pull it away from me. Yep. I need the light on on the scope. So I'm directing my team to bring in the operating microscope. And we're gonna have it in position in just a minute. All right, I need the base in um, 12 inches towards me and the anesthesiologist. That's perfect right there. That's good. All right, so in a minute, you guys are gonna be able to see through the microscope with me and Dr. Patel and we're gonna be able to see inside the disc. Now, I told you before that discectomy we did, we, we removed the disc in the front. You don't do during the laser surgery. We leave all that there. And I just go in the back of the disc with the laser and zap away the herniation, okay? Again, we couldn't do that for the surgery because the patient's neck is too thick. It wouldn't be safe. There would be a high chance of a complication. We don't want that. I got to get the microscope set. So watch your eyes, watch your hands. I'm getting the microscope set. Now, before you do anything, Dr. Patel, let me just adjust my interocular distance. Have we touched the interocular distance at all? No? Okay. Let me just focus it up. Just wait, just wait, okay? Wait till I'm done. <coughs> Because you're going to have to make adjustments after I make adjustments. <laughs> All right, that's good. Go ahead, Dr. Patel. So at this point, I've adjusted the zoom and magnification um, and the amount of light intensity as well as the focus. All right? So zoom, which is your magnification, and the focus and the light intensity. Can you see okay there, Sean? <coughs> yes, it looks good. All right, so this was the front of the disc here. Remember, it was ripped off of the bottom of the bone from trauma, and now 90% of the disc is gone. It was sitting in here. And it's because the, of this technique that all these surgeons do where they have to remove the front of the disc to get to the back here where the herniation's pushing on the spinal cord. Because of this, you have to put something in this space afterwards, like a cage, and do a fusion. Because we don't take the disc out with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, you don't have to do any fusion or put any metal or anything in here, okay? 
So I'm still scraping out bits and pieces of disc. We're really right on top of the herniation at this point. We're going to have that in a minute. Get a pituitary, Dr. Patil. All right. Kerosene. Yep. This is a kerosene, and it really grabs bone and ligaments and takes them out nicely. So I'm going to check. There, there's a piece of cartilage Dr. Patel is grabbing. I'm going to check our distraction on the disc space. I want to make it as distracted as possible because we want to open that disc up as much as possible. This will be a seven, most likely, seven millimeter cage. Dr. Patel, can you see okay? Yep. All right, can you suck for me down there? Now, what I'm seeing at the back of the disc is a lot of inf inflammation. Is this the three or two? Three, yeah, let me have a four, actually. I can see the herniation right here, right there. You can see things moving out. That's where the worst part of the herniation is. And we're going to get down to all that. I just got to scrape it all out. Like I said, we've taken out 90% of the disc to get to the part in the back where the spinal cord and nerves are being pinched. Okay, here's all pieces of cartilage. Now, wh why do we remove the cartilage? Because we're fusing these bones. You can't fuse two bones that have cartilage still on them. So part of prepping, prepping the bones for fusion, I'm being aggressive and removing all the cartilage, okay? This is all inflamed and scarred back here. A lot of inflammatory tissue from uh, the injury, the herniation. Herniations cause inflammation. That's how the body heals the herniation. The problem is it doesn't always work. Then we have to do surgery. Drill. At this point, we've got bone spurs in the back of the disc that need to be removed. They're not big bone spurs, but there are bone spurs. So this will help open things up by removing with a drill. bone graft or bone remover. We're going to save some of these bone uh, for uh, fusing, fusing the patient. We're going to put it inside the spacer you're going to see in just a few minutes. Okay, we call that a peak cage. And this is plenty of bone graft. And why do we want this bone? Well, it's got lots of stem cells for, um, go ahead, you can suck, for promoting fusion. A lot of good stuff. Cytokines, uh, there's a bone spur right there. You see that? Okay, herniation. The soft stuff is herniation. Remember, what happens to uh, herniations over time? Suck it all. Just suck it out. Is that they calcify, they get hard, they turn into bone spurs. Curet? <clears throat> I think this is going to be a seven. Yep, that's what I need. So this is the back of the disc. This is where the worst herniation is. And this is part of the herniation right here. I'm pulling it out off of the spinal cord. Suck, please. I need your help, Dr. Patel. Pituitary and sucking. Right there is another piece right there. Okay, there's a piece right there. Get that. Wipe. Grab that stuff, Dr. Patel. Come on. I'm not going to send you a written invitation. You just don't push down. Let me have a pituitary. This angle is kind of bad for you, but you need a sucker and a pituitary. Great song. All right, so these are all pieces of the herniation right here. There's still more. And a lot of people think herniations come out one piece, but they don't. They actually come out in many, many fragments. And this patient's no exception. There's, look at all this red stuff. This is all highly, highly inflamed tissue. So a lot of inflammation going on right here. Suck, please. Oh, I need a kerosene, too, probably. There's a...
suction. So every time I come out, I need you in sucking. Maybe get a smaller sucker if you need to. All right, let me have a curette. All right, what I'm going to try to do is, this is a lot of inflamed posterior ligament right here from the inflammation of the herniation. I'm going to try to create a plane between it and the, this is more herniation right there. I'm going to try to create, suck please. I'm trying to try to create a plane here between the back of the vertebral body and an osteophyte and the spinal cord, kerosene two. Now imagine this would be impossible to do without the microscope, okay? This is it two? Let me see. Wipe. All right, suck please, keep sucking for me. I gotta see the, all the little areas down here. And that requires sucking. All right, let me have a pituitary. That's a piece of calcified herniation right there. Let me have a cure at two. Yes, sir. A thinner sucker. What is that, a nine? He needs like a seven. Let me have a cure at two. I said cure at two, not cure at two. All right, let's see here. Suck, 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 suck. Suck, suck. Let me see here. Gentle. That looks like probably it could be dura. Suck for me. And it's very common for this stuff to get stuck to the dura. We don't want, we don't like that, but. That's what it looks like. Let me see here, Patel. I need you to suck right there. Come on. Help me out. Suck. It's really hard to tell. What we want to do is get the pressure off the dura. Any more questions, Sean? Sean? Uh, suck, please. Suck this. Yeah. Uh, what what's the regular size cage that we do? Oh. Yeah, he's got kind of a wide disc space. Is there a template? I can't see. Is there a template I can use to figure it out? All right. Harrison. I can't tell you right now. I don't know. Okay. Wipe. Yes, you have a question, Sean? Uh, one of the viewers is just asking which kind of, uh, what kind of music do you prefer to listen to while you're doing surgery? What kind of music do we listen to? We listen to all kinds of music. Um, today we're listening to classic rock. But we've listened to, that was a big herniation right there. Look at all that scar tissue right on top of the spinal cord in Dura, crazy. We listen to, um, I listen to some, sometimes jazz, sometimes uh, techno, sometimes, come on, this is in my way. When you feel me bump you, it's time to move. Take. Uh, today we're listening to classic rock, which I love. It comes from my days in high school, college, back in the 80s. Suck, please. And uh, I have a lot, of, a lot of memories from classical rock. So look how bad the pinching on the, the patient's right side is compared to the left. The herniation's worse over here on my side than it was on Dr. Patel's. Really much worse right here. You can see it. Big, big herniation here. I think he's going to do really, really well when we're done. Getting it all out, just little pieces, unfortunately. Sometimes we get the big guy coming out at one time, but most of the time it's, it's called piecemeal. Piecemeal means you're getting little pieces out at a time. And that's what we're doing. 
This is the nerve is being crushed right here. Absolutely crushed. So we're uncrushing it. And I'm using the what's called the kerosene rondure to do that. Kerosene, K E R R I S O N. Good job, Dr. Patel. Did you not find a smaller sucker? I mean, isn't that a nine, Luis? Wipe, please. Wipe. Isn't that a nine you gave him? There should be a seven on the field. Huh? It nine is, that's what he's got. He needs a seven. We used to always have a seven in a set. Wow, look at that. Let me have a little bit bigger. Nice job, Patel. You got a little piece of disc there. Um, so you see what I'm doing, folks? I'm opening the hole where the nerve goes out. It's called the neural foramen. Suck. So you don't have a seven on the set, Luis? We have two nine and then a longer one. I mean, it should be on the preference sheet, Luis. Is it not? Great. Take. I need the drill. Actually, let me have a bigger kerosene first. So I'm, I'm working out the right foramen at C67, <coughs> and I need a bigger kerosene. And there's a lot of, careful, there's a lot of uh, bony material, like calcified disc material here, and osteophyte. So, uh, gentle now. So I... Um, I, I need to, to remove more of the, what's called the uncinate process, uh, which is blocking me from opening that hole all the way. So I'm gonna do that, but I can't really see it that well, so I'm, I have to take more of this lateral disc out. You see that bone down there? We're gonna drill that away. That's the best way to do it, okay? It's part of the uncinate process. See that, Dr. Patel? Mm -hmm. See how it's sloping up and back? Drill. So I could sit there and try to get it with a kerosene, but every time I do that, I'm potentially going to traumatize the nerve root because the foot of footprint of the kerosene goes against the nerve. So I'm actually just going to drill some of this bone away a little bit more laterally and open things up. A little bit of spur here at the bottom. Okay. Let's see if I can... Remember, we're going to put a spacer in here, so I want to get rid of all the, the uh, lip spur so it's nice and parallel. Okay. Suck all that gentle irrigation. It not, may not be done. Irrigate. Suck, suck, suck. Show me my work. All right. I'm going to take a little more down right here. You can see it needs to be removed, contoured. Okay. Show me. Yep, I'm going to take a little bit more there. This drill is called a neuro bit. Take that. I need a kerosene. What did I have? A two or three before? Uh, no, you had a four before. Well, what was I using first when I was working on the disc? Uh, Let me see a three. Yes, sir. The bigger the kerosene, the better, um, because you get better bites. Suck, suck. Did you have another question, Sean? Gentle? No others currently. That's the nerve, by the way. That's the C7 nerve root right there. It just took a nice bite of, of bone and disc material and thickened ligament. Decompressed the foramen. Didn't he say, which side did he say he was worse? Right. Left, side. Left. Left side? Wow. That's amazing because the, this is his right side, Tuck. And it's definitely worse. Let me see um, a kerosene smaller. So that white thing down there is the nerve root. Tuck. Yeah, let me see if I can. A little piece of bone there. Tuck, tuck. Mm -hmm. Good. You're doing great, Dr. Patel. Thank you. Let's have a little gel foam. Actually, let me have the curette first. Curette two. Let's see if we can get a plane. So stay there. Let's see if I can get a plane here. 
Let me in. Let me see. Suck, suck behind me. Suck behind me. Again, give it to me again. Beautiful. Look at that. See the spinal cord, folks? All right, Harrison. Three. Oh, I have a two or three. I, have a two or three. I want a three. Yes, sir. Dr. Patel, you're doing great. Keep up. I'm going to come right where you are and grab that inflamed ligament. Suck. Okay, good. Now we're really starting to see the spinal cord. That is the dura around the spinal cord, folks. I'm going to open up his um, left side. Show me. Keep going. Yep, perfect. See that vein right there, that purpley vein? That's right where the nerve root goes out the foramen. And I want to try to not cut that vein, but it looks really good right here. I don't see any more compression on the root. Show me. Yeah. And then my side looks good. So I feel like the foramen is wide open now. Let me see here. Suck, suck. Let me just get one more bite. All right. I think, let me see the curette too. So folks, that's the spinal cord and the nerve roots down there. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. All right. All right, there's no pressure with that thing, but it's like a little shell of bone. And I don't want to injure the root trying to get it out, but there's no pressure on the root. So it feels good. Gel foam? Let's go. Gel foam cotton. All right, out. So the gel foam is soaked in thrombin. And we're going to just put it in there for a minute. Suck on top of this, please. Gently. Yep. Suck, suck. OK, come out. Take, Luis. Come on. Suck. Suck, suck, get that blood out. Oh, no. Come out, please. All right, so these tools we're using, these thrombin and gel foam. Suck, please. Your side, Dr. Patel. Okay, let me borrow this. You can't put them on top of blood clots. So you have to aggressively suck the blood clots and put them on top of the bleeding veins. They don't work when you put them on top of blood. They only work when you put them on top of bleeding veins so a lot of doctors don't know that and understand it but it's a fact all right looking good I, we're going to be a seven and i would say let's try a medium i mean let's see what a medium before you pack it let me just try it watch your eyes Any questions from our audience? Oh, we have another viewer asking what just song you're currently listening to. One of our viewers asked what? Come on. Uh, disturbed, the sound of silence. Yeah, this is disturbed and the sound of silence. This may be too big. Let me see. Hmm. Actually, that's pretty nice. I don't know. I don't know. I'm contemplating. Uh, I say we just go with the, that's a seven is the right size, okay. but I, I just say we go with the small. It's, it's pushing it a little bit. And what I don't want to do is push something into the foramen laterally. All right, drill. That was disturbed, the sound of silence, in case you're wondering. Um, where is our viewer from? I'm decorticating the center here, so it promotes bone growth. So I want the bone to grow across here. I want this bone to grow to this bone and attach to each other through here. So we're going to fill the center of the cage with bone graft. Thank you, Luis. I'll show you just so you can see what I'm talking about. It creates a bridge of bone graft. You see that? The cage is now filled with bone graft. We use a, a narrower cage. Okay. 
Yeah, I want the smallest plate as usual. All right, that's perfect. Now, some people might be tempted to use a wider cage. The problem is the wider the cage, you can start pushing pieces of disc material or ligament or bone way over there in the corner onto the nerve root after sur during the surgery. And then the patient will wake up with new arm pain or new arm symptoms they didn't have before. So I don't want to do that. Joe Foam? Yes, sir. He does have a nice wider disc than normal, but I'm not going to be I'm not going to gild the lily. I'm not going to make that mistake. Yes, sir. There's I don't think any benefit to a suck over here, please, a wider cage biomechanically. I don't think there's any benefit biomechanically compared to the smaller one, given the forces in the neck. The forces in the neck are not huge. They're not like the lower back. All right. We're done with the cage. We're removing our posts post remover we're going to put a plate in that will take about five minutes and then we're going to irrigate and get hemostasis and close no, no 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 i need to remove the posts come on post remover suck please dr patel you should be uh, are you falling asleep bone wax on a stick Ready. or on a kitty so we're going to plug these little holes with bone wax, which which we stole that idea from dentists. Watch your eyes. But it's used in surgery, bone wax is, um, by orthopedics and neurosurgeons. I need a Penfield one. I don't want to grab all that soft tissue when I go down. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You should know what I use. I use the same thing every time, Luis. You've done this with me. Bone wax on a kitty. Right. Take. All right, we need a pickup. So we're going to take this bone, extra bone wax out. And I'm going to look over here and I see a little piece there. Get that out. I'm going to check the hole. The hole's not bleeding. It's perfect. Check this hole. It's not bleeding. We are ready for the plate. I have a, a special plate I use because the ones they, they sell normally are too big, too long. So I have a 10 millimeter they've made for me, which is perfect. Look at that. So you want, you want the, the, in my opinion, everyone does this differently. What you don't want is you don't want the top of the metal way up here pushing on the next disc or the bottom of the metal down here, down there pushing on the next disc. So you really want the plate to fit perfectly and properly. So I look for, in the window, there should be half the bottom of the bone and half the cage on both ends. Basically, you should see half and half. Now, these things like to move around a little bit, so I have to try to stabilize it here. A mistake is to push down hard initially with your drill bit. I don't do that. You have to come down gingerly. What that means is you just barely touch as you go in, and that'll otherwise your your plate will start shifting all over the place. It's a little trick. So let's see, I'm I'm kind of drilling into the bone, up into the bone, and I'm screwing up into the bone. Now I like to leave this one not too tight. You want to make sure there's no soft tissue. Oh great. You want to suck, please, and I need you with the retractor, Dr. Patel, helping me. Okay, you should be retracting this soft tissue down here so it doesn't get in my way. Uh, I wouldn't leave that exposed like that's the esophagus. Make sure you're below the esophagus, touching the bone with the tip. I don't want it to pop out suddenly, and you got to get your hand out of the way. I can't get this down. Okay. People think being a surgeon is easy, but it takes tremendous thought. Let me have the drill, yes, sir. the other drill, okay? There's a little spur right here I'm not happy about. See that? I'm gonna have to get rid of it. That's why they get you? Take, I'm done. The other mistake people think is, oh, all the, the plates, they always have to be straight. 
I need you to move your hand. You know how to do that? There you go. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's not right. Okay. Let's have, um, we're not ready to count. Okay, I need your help. I need you here. This guy wants to wiggle around. Mm, let me have the impactor and the mallet. Take this. Patel, I really need you to suck. I mean, that's why you got a sucker in your hand. Come on. actually screwing these screws into the bone folks into the c6 and c7 vertebrae so that's called fixation internal fixation okay good perfect and again I'm aiming up for the screws at the top and I'm aiming down for the screws at the bottom you want to aim up for the screws at the top and aim down for the screws at the bottom and notice how the top of my plate doesn't go past the mid, middle of the vertebral body. So many surgeons make these sloppy mistakes. They'll put the top of their plate way up here so it's rubbing on the next disc. Well, then that means you're going to be coming back for another surgery, folks. If that plate, metal plate is rubbing on a disc, guess who's going to win? The disc versus the plate. The plate's going to win every time. It's steel or titanium in this case. Okay, it's an alloy. But um, surgeons don't think about that stuff. I mean, even in my own training, that was really not even emphasized. But it's something that's very important because you don't want your intervention to really cause the need for more intervention, okay? You want to be like a ninja, a ninja spine surgeon where you come in and do just the minimal of what you need to do and then you're gone and nobody even notices you, okay? So it's important in surgery to minimize collateral damage and just focus and focus your entire effort and everything onto doing the minimal you need to do without causing more problems. So the plate appears to be flush with the spine. We're going to check that. Stay where you are. Suck for me, please, Penfield. Yep. There, there's the spine right there. It's looking good. We didn't trap the soft tissues. The bottom of the plate is in the middle of the vertebral body. We got a nice cage in there. Everything's looking good. I'm happy with that. Dr. Patel, you happy? All right, let's come out. Let's irrigate. Actually, we can't even get an x-ray. Um, yeah, we need irrigation just a little bit, just a little bit, and then I, thank you, and then I need, um, how are you going to reverse? Neostigmine? Neostigmine is fine, and a little what? We got, we got another 15 minutes cause before we have the bandage on. We got. I really am hoping he has two twitches because that's where I really want him to be at this point. All right, let me get in. All right, so we're by the time we're closed, he should have two. Yeah, it's going to take a little while to get all the behemoths. Come on, take it. Irrigation. Come on, Patel. When I put it there, you got to lock it in. Suction, suction, suction. Mm. 
I need a bipolar ready. Show me where the bleeding is. It's probably coming. I need more irrigation. You see it, Patel? There it is. I need in. You got to move your hand. I need to see where it's bleeding here, Dr. Patel. Please suck here. Come on. Y you got to use the sucker on your other hand. He needs to retract. He needs to move the sucker to the other side. He's bumping up against my hand. Okay. Irrigation. Show me. Where's the rest of the bleeding? Patel, we got to move around till we find it. Suck, suck, suck. Okay. All right. Let's start looking around. Let's go north. Slide north. Up here. I need sucking, please. Yep, right up here. I need to see it. You got to move your retractor north. There you go. Suck, please. Suck, suck, suck. Right here. Don't push me. In and out, in and out. I need to get over here. go north. I don't know where you're going. We need to go north. Watch your eyes. Y you got to get your knee north. There you go. There you go. I love it. Let me see up here. Yep. Nice. Yep. There's not going to be much up here because we really didn't do anything up here. But you never know. There could be like a little vein somewhere just waiting to bleed. Okay, keep going south. Yep, keep going. We're on your side now. I need to see here. Yep. Beautiful. Let's uh, watch your eyes. I'm going to angle south. See how nice uh, hemostasis at the end of the case? Okay. White. White, please. Pull this back. Pull this back. Not the toe, but the knee. There you go. I need gel foam and thrombin. I'm going to sneak that back in the corner there. Good job. All right, let's see. Now we just need down here. I just need you to pull that knee back so I can see. It's like a teeter-totter, isn't it? Okay, I need to see right here. Right up here. There you go. See how there's a little bleeder in there? Suck for me. It's hidden. We've got to be able to see it. You want to try to re-grab and reposition? Okay, you're, you're applying really good, let me see it. You're applying really good force, but look, just two fingers. Look at that, okay? I'm not stronger than you. It's how you apply force. You see that? I gotta be able to see over here. All right, uh, I gotta see right over here. I need to see just under your retractor right here. Hey, let me have a gel foam and thrombin again. Yes, Luis, bring the gel foam and thrombin and put it here. Yes, sir. Okay. Hold this, Luis. Right here. Okay. Let me have yours, Patel. Give you a little break. Suck for me. All right, that's good. Okay, you want it back? This is where you always get into trouble with a little bit of bleeding. 
just in the corners here. Okay, you got it? I know you can drive a golf ball really far. Your technique is perfect. How many yards can you hit a golf ball? How many yards? yards. What's the furthest? Pull that back. Your, your, uh, knee, your knee. Bring it back. No, no. There you go. What's the furthest you've ever hit the golf ball? 300. 300? Patel? Uh -huh. 300 yards? 300 or 400? That's pretty incredible. And Dr. Patel is hits it well. I think I got 100 yards once. <laughs> I'm terrible at golf. All right, you see the little vein there? That's the kind of stuff that will bleed at 2 o'clock in the morning. So you want to make sure you get it now. Now, that's very nice. Now, let's look at the walls. Let's slide up the walls a little bit, Patel. Let's look at the walls. Yeah, just kind of show me the walls here. They're looking pretty good. I don't see any active bleeding. There's a little branch of the Anza cervicalis right there. A little bit of disc material. I mean, it's looking good, huh? Let's get our gel, uh, gel foam in there. Okay, you ready? Pull it back. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Come on in. Uh, out. Good, good. Watch your eyes. All right, we're here at the surface again. Now, suck this, please. When you cook, let's keep our blood pressure good and low, like around 100, 110 throughout recovery. Perfect. Love it. These are just little veins right there. Y'all see those little purpley veins? And what happens is you'll, you'll be closing the wound and then your needle will hit one of them and they'll start bleeding. So I like to get them preemptively. This is the platysma muscle. He's got a nice, well-developed platysma. We're on the surface of the sternocleidomastoid. Again, the omohyoid, all the rest of the strap muscles. There's no bleeding. We probably lost 10 cc's of blood the whole case. All right, let's close this. Nice job, Luis. So we're gonna close the platysma. Dr. Patel, you wanna do this? I'll get you started. All right, so you gotta find the platysma. Do you see where it is? It's literally right there. It's a little purple, you know? It's purple. Are you, are you wanna tie? Are you able to tie? All right, here. Give Dr. Patel the suture. Sure. I'll tie for him. You need a pickup? So this stitch is, uh, does not have to be inverted. It's just a simple stitch. I would grab the muscle. Grab the muscle. Yeah, you want to grab it and, and just kind of pull it towards you gently. Try not to get the subcutaneous tissue. Yep. And then on your side, yep. Not too deep because you might get a vein in there. So just where you can see. You're doing good. That's it, perfect. Let me have it. Get the needle, give it back. So the platysma muscle is the first muscle you're gonna, your first layer you're gonna close. You don't close anything deeper to that. Careful, don't get the fat. You don't want the fat. Because then you won't be able to do the sub-Q. Yep. There you go, nice technique, I like that. You kind of grab the muscle and bring it to the needle, right? Very good, I like that. That's a smart technique. Um, I thought these are the ones we're going to use for the sub-Q. Not for the skin, the skin we have the other one. Okay. Yeah, one more should be enough right here. Dr. Patel nails that one. Yeah, grab it there, and I'll just go put the, the needle right behind your grabber. Or right next to it, there you go. 
And when you get the platysma, careful over there, there's veins over there. So yeah, yeah, that's fine. When you get the platysma, oh no, no, grab the needle, not this muscle. You want to make sure you get the fascia around it, okay? It's weird sewing under the microscope, isn't it? Dr. Patel? Let me have one more suture. Okay, watch your hand. So, let me have a pickup. I was hoping to be able to do it that way, but I just want to get the bottom of the incision here because sometimes gravity, right? What's going to happen? Everything's going to come down, come down this direction. Fucking suture. And then the patient's going to have a little bit of leakage. Keep your hand away from my needle. And then they're going to freak out, right? Dr. Patel? Yeah. They get really nervous, so. And of course, they call you and then you're like, I, I can't really tell. You just hear bleeding at 2 in the morning and you're like, well, I can't really tell if it's normal or not. So come to the emergency room. And then they sit there in the emergency room and have to wait for three hours. And then they, they go home five minutes later. Scissor. So it's better to try to <coughs> anticipate those kind of things. Is this running? Uh, you can just pop up. Just pop up if you want. I hate running, but honestly, I hate closing wounds. Let's face it. A senior surgeon should not have to close a wound, but hey, c'est la vie. Right, Dr. Patel? That's why I need your fellow. He should learn how to close wounds. You know what I mean? Every fellow should know basic surgical closing, opening and closing of skin. Okay, watch it. Watch the needle. Yes, sir. Is okay? Is it? Yeah. Now this is a very important layer in surgery is the, sk is the skin. A lot of people don't understand how important it is. Let me have the pop-offs because these aren't pop-offs, right? You have the white ones, one yeah, more? Yeah. yeah, but we need more, right? If I'm popping them off. You understand? I'm popping these I off. But how many do you want? Hmm. How many do you need? Well, normally to close a wound like this, I need uh, a lot. I need 10. 10? Yeah, but these, these get very expensive. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, cost the, money. The, the, the ones money. that come in a pack are usually designed to be used as multiples. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yes, sir. Are these, do these come in a pack or do they come as singles? These come as singles. Yeah. But yeah, but it's actually, th they, uh, These are cutters, right? Correct, sir. Yes. You request for right? Okay. Yeah, but yeah. they are really aggressive cutters. Oh. <laughs> I like to close this with uh, interrupted, meaning multiple sutures, the okay. not the runners. So that's your pack sutures. You understand? We have a question. Let's have the purple ones. Yeah. What are you is wondering, what type of sutures do you use and how long does it take them to dissolve? We use re dissolving sutures. Nobody knows how long it takes them to dissolve. It's impossible to know. But if you ever have to open a patient back up and look, you'll see they're still there a year later. Um, so they dissolve very slowly. Sutures are only needed for maybe a few months while the tissues heal. And once the tissues are healed, you don't need them. But you can't go back in and take them out. I got it. Because going back in to take them out means you have to cut the patient again, which you means you have to suture them, them again. Yeah. You're going to need a lot more than that. Maybe another pack. 
This is an important suture because if you don't take the tension off the skin edges, the patients can get an ugly scar. So you want to get the pressure off the edges of the skin so that they can heal properly. And I see this step done wrong so much, not by me, but by other surgeons. Patient comes in and they've got a horrible looking scar that's really very wide, spread wide. And uh, it looks bad. So <coughs> for cosmetic reasons, you want to make sure that the um, tension is off the skin edges. See where I'm coming through, Dr. Patel? Now, a lot of surgeons don't close the skin with a microscope. I think I might be the only one that does that. But why not use the extra information you have, right? If you've got it, you might as well use it. It doesn't hurt your skin closure to have more visual information. It only helps. Generally, our skin closures are, are really good here at Duke Spine. I've never had a patient complain about it. The scars heal very nicely. And that's, that's for, in my opinion, mainly because we we do a good job with the uh, suturing. You like this one skin suture? Hmm? You like this one skin? I don't understand what you're saying. If you like this type of suture and skin, your skin, right? Yeah. Okay, good. This is exactly what I want. Okay, good. Except they have an undyed one. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay, you want but That's what I've asked for before. Yeah, okay. It's an undyed 10 pack or whatever this pack is, however many come in this pack. It's a pop-off and it's the same needle. That's the best. Any other questions, Sean? None currently. I think we're done, Luis. I may need one more. You always want to get that one at the bottom. Because that keeps all the juices from coming out and really scaring the hell out of the patient. Good? I think we're done. Let me just check the uh, suture line. Yeah, maybe one more here. And the pickups I'm using are called Adson pickups. They're pretty standard. They have a little tooth and they have serrations. The serrations grab the needle. The tooth grabs the skin. They have some without serrations. I don't like them because the needle starts flopping around everywhere. All right. Scope is out. You guys got this? Good job, everyone. Tough case because of the thickness of the neck.
Um, had to do things the incision a little different, but everything worked out, and I think he's going to have a really good result. All right, where's the other paperwork? Anything else I need to sign? I'm going to head over to the conference room and answer questions. So anybody have a question, type it up, and we'll get it answered for you. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us for the post-op Q&A. We have Dr. Duke in the room with us now that the surgery is finished, ready to answer some of your questions. If you have any questions remaining about your own neck and back pain, feel free to type them up now, and we'll display them on the screen. For now, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Duke so he can discuss the outcome of this recent case. Okay, everyone, this was an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. It's a surgery that's been done not the same way I do it, but um, the concept of cleaning out the disc, putting a spacer, and fusing the bones. This has been done for 60, 70 years now. Um, before this type of approach and surgery were uh, discovered or pioneered by some of the earlier spine surgeons of this century, what happened was um, the most popular way to deal with a pinched nerve going down your arm uh, from a herniated disc in the neck was to do a procedure in the back of the neck called a foramenotomy. And that's where the surgeon would go through the muscles, basically drill a hole in the back of your spine, very bad, and then uh, try to pull disc material from around the nerve root, but basically opening the hole where the nerve exits the spine from the back. Um, even though the herniation was in the front, the bone spurs were in the front. So it didn't work very well, didn't give very good results, this posterior cervical foramenotomy. And uh, I don't remember if it was Cloward who discovered the uh, anterior cervical, or it could have been, um, um, I think it was Cloward uh, who described, who really popularized for neurosurgeons, the approach going through the front of the neck. Obviously, going through the front of the neck, you saw from our exposure in the beginning of the case that you have to mobilize a lot of tissues, including the carotid artery, carotid uh, jugular vein, which both of them are in the carotid sheath. And we retracted that towards the surgeon, which was really, um, you know, laterally, we call it, away from the patient's axis and then uh, retracted the trachea and esophagus medially. That was Dr. Patel retracting that most of the case. And then straight down between those structures is the spine itself, which you saw. And uh, the surgery was focused on the disc 
in the spine, particularly the C67 disc. So um, the anterior approach has been more popular to get to herniated discs and treat them when they're symptomatic, as in this case, this has been a, been a more popular approach in the last 50, 40, 50 years. And people have steered away from the posterior cervical foraminotomy approach because it doesn't work as well. Plus, it's more, more bleeding and more morbidity. Obviously, many years ago, before there was good hemostasis, and hemostasis is very important to be able to do a surgery like this. So hemostasis means to stop the bleeding from the blood vessels. Obviously, if I didn't have gel foam and thrombin, bipolars, a bovi, those are all tools that surgeons use, modern day tools, that really are very, very successful strategies at stopping bleeding or preventing excessive bleeding. And so we lost for this whole surgery 10, maybe 10, probably less than 10, eight, eight milliliters of blood, which is nothing. Um, but if you don't have a coagulator, such as a bovi or bipolar, if you don't have uh, recombinant thrombin and gel foam, then, you know, 30, 40 years ago doing these surgeries, they were very bloody and very risky going through the front of the neck. Um, so it's really advances in equipment, technology, and technique that have allowed surgeons to do these surgeries uh, in modern times very safely and effectively. Um, and then, of course, we're doing our surgeries outpatient. So this patient will go home in an hour. Uh, we'll monitor him, make sure he's hemodynamically stable, uh, check his neurological exam and recovery, make sure he's up walking and peeing and, and he's wide awake before we send him home. We are going to put the patient in a collar. That's a, it's an Aspen collar we use. Other people use different collars, but it's basically an uh, external rigid uh, immobilization device. It's basically a has Velcro and plastic to hold and support the neck. Uh, what we don't want is this patient, say, falling and then ruining uh, or getting into a car accident and suffering a whiplash and ruining the work we just did. So the collar stabilizes the spine while the bones heal and fuse over the next three to six months, but it also is a reminder for the patient not to do too much. So it does, so it has several functions, but ultimately it's stabilizing the neck and you know, reminding the patient they just had neck surgery, so don't go crazy and do all kinds of activities. Um, this patient will go home today, and, you know, some patients are able to go back to work within a week, some within a few days. Uh, half the patients that have this kind of surgery take narcotics when we do it at Duke Spine. The other half don't take narcotics. They take Tylenol only because they don't have any pain. The kind of complaints people have after this kind of surgery include trouble swallowing, usually for a few days, because remember, we're removing the esophagus to the side. The esophagus is a swallowing tube. It's a long muscular tube, and uh, we didn't have to retract it very hard, but the harder you have to retract it, the more trouble patients have with swallowing. So what I've learned over the years is to have a generous, wide exposure. That way you minimize the amount of um, retraction force that needs to be applied to the esophagus. A lot of surgeons don't understand that. Spine surgeons will usually try to make small incisions. Small incisions create more problems for patients, far more problems. When I saw the depth of this patient's neck, when I saw the limited visibility with the x-ray to, to ver verify where we were, I, I realized we needed a bigger incision right away. Um, and so we did a oblique incision along the medial border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which gave us excellent visibility, gave us safe exposure, and much less retraction on the blood vessels and the esophagus. So it was the right choice. Uh, I recognized it right away in the surgery when we started taking x-ray pictures, and we could only see the top of the spine. So um, overall, challenging case. This is honestly the deepest neck I think I've ever done. Um, we used a 55 millimeter long um, retractor blade and a 60 millimeter long retractor blade medially, which is normally I'm at 40, 45. On a skinny patient, 30, 35. On an average patient with kind of a thicker neck, 40, 45. But this was a 55, 60. So um, he almost had us at the longest blades we have for retracting. Other than that, I was very happy. We had very little blood loss. So the anesthesiologist did a phenomenal job of relaxing the patient. 
that let's talk about that for a minute. So muscle relaxation, very important in this case. Any type of spine surgery, I use very generous muscle relaxation right away in the beginning, and I hope that it wears off. Um, we want really two twitches or more, maybe three twitches if possible, or even four at the end of the case. That means the patient's going to recover faster. So this patient had probably two twitches when we finished up the bandage, which allows the anesthesiologist to recover the patient safely and efficiently using uh, neostigmine and some Robinol. And so that's what I think they're doing. They're waiting to extubate the patient for a few minutes and then we'll get the patient off to recovery. Any questions, Sean, since I've been talking? Our audience knows everything about ACDF. Once again, ACDF, in my opinion, will be a type of surgery that is reserved only for patients that have um, an anatomy or anatomical features, such as an extremely thick neck that it's not safe to do the endoscopic surgery. And the other thing is if they have a metal plate covering their disc from the front, or if they have a huge bone spur in the front um, covering the disc that prevents the endoscopic surgery from being done. That said, I believe personally, you know, today there's about 300,000 ACDFs done every year in the United States alone. Worldwide, there's probably 20,000 done for herniated discs. I believe virtually all 20,000 minus, say, 1,000 um, will be done with endoscopic surgery, the Duke laser disc repair. Duke Spine Institute and myself are the first surgeons in the world and the first location in the world to perform the Duke laser disc repair. And what sets that apart from the South Koreans who uh, have done anterior cervical endoscopic surgery in the past and have for the most part stopped doing it uh, because of complications, there are several things that I've done different than them in my technique. One of them is my patients are completely asleep under general anesthesia. They're intubated endotracheal intubation on a ventilator and fully relaxed. So there's no movement during the surgery. The Koreans had some problems with patients moving because they were awake while they were doing the surgery and there were spinal cord injuries and even death. And so the Duke laser disc repair done here at Duke Spine Institute is very safe. We've never had a complication in 15 years of me doing the Duke laser disc repair procedures. So our endoscopic anterior cervical surgery is complication free. I've done, um, on the cervical spine, I've probably done about 500 cases now. And I will tell you, it takes about a year and about 50 cases really to get comfortable doing it. Um, but it's something that can be taught to any spine surgeon. I've actually been invited to present the Duke laser disc repair technique to the AANS, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. I presented it, I believe it was Miami. It was several years ago, about eight, nine years ago. And then at the uh, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, I presented the Duke laser disc repair. North American Spine Society, I presented the Duke laser disc repair. And um, ISAS, the International Society for the Advancement of Spine Surgery. Uh, these are all the biggest organizations in the world for spine surgery advancements. I've presented my technique at all of them. It's interesting though, many surgeons um, have not adopt adopted it um, for reasons that probably it, it looks intimidating and technically difficult, and it is, but it's something that can be taught. So I believe that these worldwide 20,000 ACDFs done every year will be converted, 19,000 of them, or 95% of them will be converted eventually to anterior cervical endoscopic surgery because there's no need for fusion, there's no need for metal, there's no need for bone graft, there's no need for open surgery. It's all done outpatient and it's done with a four millimeter incision. All right, um, we do have a question. So Sean is gonna read it out loud. So one of our viewers has had a cervical fusion and now they have adjacent segment disease at T1, T2. Their current doctor said they cannot do a posterior approach or an anterior approach and they do not want to do the posterior approach. Will Duke laser disc repair be able to fix the bulging disc at T1, T2? At T1, T2. Okay, so one of our viewers is saying, hey, um, 
somebody had a cervical fusion and now they have a disc herniation next to the fusion. We call that adjacent segment disease. Very common in fusion surgery, very bad. You don't want that. Um, with Duke laser disc repair, there is no such thing as adjacent segment disease because we're not immobilizing or treating the disc with any kind of fusion or artificial disc. And the question is, are you able to do the Duke laser disc repair at T1, T2? T1, T2 for a herniated disc. So great question. And I will say this. I'll preface it by saying this. For 15 years, I have been doing cervical and lumbar disc herniation repairs with the endoscope. And just this year in 2020, I started doing thoracic disc herniations. And T1, T2 is a thoracic disc herniation. So the answer is most likely I could fix it endoscopically at T1, T2. I just need to see the MRI and I need to see the patient's body habitus, you know, what the shape of their body looks like so I can see if I can safely access that herniation and repair with the laser. So, um, I would say right now the chances are pretty good that I could fix it endoscopically, um, but I would need to see the MRI and I would need to see through video conference, of course, or in person, the patient themselves. So I would say just kind of picking probabilities, at least 50% chance I could fix it, the T1, T2 disc herniation with the laser. All right, folks, we're all done, and I appreciate everyone watching and questions. And, again, the surgery went well. We'll check on the patient shortly once he's fully awake and um, recovered.